Simon, thank you so much for joining me on the Teachers Podcast today. No problem. We are at Reading Rocks North. We are. Um, and you're going to be doing a workshop later. Yes, I am talking about purpose of, of why, how we get children to read. And, yeah. and different ways we can get you up to read. So. Fantastic. And, um, do you know, I'm really happy that you're here because I did a podcast with Carl Duke um, a few weeks ago and he suggested that you should be on the podcast. All oh, right, okay. We're quite good friends. so it's, Yeah, uh, which yeah. is great because now I don't have to kind of seek you out and you're here on All the right. day. Brilliant. Even better. So thank you for giving up your time. Oh, no problem. And um, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions now, so I hope you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Right. So the first thing I ask everyone to do is give me a backstory of how they got into teaching, the journey through teaching, just so we know about you, your experience, and why we should listen to what you're saying. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'd never wanted to be a teacher. Kind of was never what I wanted to do. I, I did a degree in psychology, uh, God, 30 odd years ago. Uh, so, which is a long time. So yeah. I'm feeling quite old now by just talking about it. <laughs> uh, and, and then had a couple of years where didn't know what I wanted to do really so so I'm you know if you don't know what to do teach that's me I am that person yes, uh, so yes. I had a couple of years so am I where I traveled and uh odd jobs I worked in a factory mm -hmm. I was a bin man for a bit I'd kind of uh, worked in a French exchange went to Romania for four months and, yep. and worked at a, it's a, a school project uh, making the school self-sustainable building mm -hmm. uh greenhouses and a radio station, which was really weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, really, just, uh, and then kind of came back and was like, well, what am I going to do? And, and didn't really know. So I kind of applied to be a teacher, applied for a PGCE at Leicester University and, and surprisingly got on. And it was linked to educational psychology, which I thought I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And then as it kind of went through the year, kind of found myself less and less interested in it, but yeah. more and more interested in teaching. Uh, and, and so got got qualified and and then uh met my now wife uh in in leicester uh and she'd got a job in stockton in in the northeast uh and i'm a southern boy i'm i'm from uh worcester originally mm -hmm. uh so had never been north of kind of nottingham really that was as far north as i would ever gone uh and applied for a job in middlesbrough to so so w that we could be together and give it a go uh, so I got a job in Middlesbrough, at, in Grove Hill, at a school called Martin Grove, that was then firebombed in the second week I was there, oh, uh, wow. as part of the Grove Hill riots. Welcome to the so, north. Welcome to the north. Uh, <laughs> but it was actually a fantastic school, mm -hmm. and I uh, had a brilliant head teacher, and was a, a great place to learn, mm -hmm. to, to learn about teaching. It, it was hard, but actually had a good staff. I was there five years, and then... Uh, got seconded to a school in special measures so there was a school in special measures and they were looking for teachers to come and work and i, I thought actually that's a good opportunity mm. so i kind of went to the school in special measures and it was the best decision i could ever have made it was uh had a, a brilliant head who built a brilliant team yeah. and it was the best group of people i've ever worked with mm. and the staff room was amazing we would it was that real team that real camaraderie and uh, quite yeah. a lot of swearing often uh, mm -hmm. and but really supported each other. And the school went from special measures to outstanding in, yeah. in eight years, which was amazing. We, and we went from, uh, we were the fifth most improved school in the country. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a caveat to that, because if you're the fifth most improved, you've got to be one of the worst to start with. So, so, so. Yeah, so, but still amazing but still, achievement. It was amazing achievement, but with an amazing group of people. And, and, yeah. and was a brilliant eight years, um, in which I led loads of subjects and then fell into leading English mm -hmm. uh, and, and found my passion for, books and English at kind of that point really and when that happened I, uh, the head teacher got me working with Middlesbrough Local Authority and I became mm -hmm. a lead teacher in Middlesbrough Local Authority uh, and it, it was a really good eight years and, and then I kind of at that point when we got the outstanding I thought now's the time to leave I, mm -hmm. I, I need to go to another school uh, and I got a job in another school and it was the worst decision I could possibly have made so I was I was there for two years and, mm -hmm. and at the end of two years I, I had to leave mm -hmm. it was it was soul destroying uh, yeah. and it was a head who micromanaged everything and didn't trust and didn't believe in s staff and didn't trust people to lead mm. on, on other aspects so so she basically had to manage everything and and it was soul destroying and mm. and i had and i had to leave so and i was quite lucky I, f I i fell into a job in in hartlepool as a as a consultant and left the classroom for a couple of years uh and hartlepool's 
a great local authority because it's quite small and there are only 30 schools in Hartlepool. So, wow. so being a literacy consultant in Hartlepool was actually being more like a school improvement advisor in a, in a bigger yeah, local yeah. authority. So it was lots of working with heads, lots of working with head teachers. And in, from being a person who, who was almost quit and out of schools and out of education, that reinvigorated me to understand why leadership was important. Yeah. Uh, at that point, I'd never sort of saw, seen myself as a head. Mm -hmm. uh, as a head teacher but that two years kind of made change me from that to in actually I could be a head and I could do a good job so, so it kind of refocused me I guess uh, in some ways it's it's stepping back and being able to see all of it yeah I think so and I think the other bit about working outside the schools and working at local authority level you get to see a much bigger picture so you get yeah. to see the political picture of education which which yeah. I think sometimes when you are just in schools you don't see it when you step back from yeah. that and you're working with you do bits where you're working with the DFE and yeah. you're working uh, across regional groups you start to see the political picture and and I found that really interesting mm. I found that 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 really fascinating didn't always agree with it but yeah. it would but in terms of then setting me up for how I think about schools position in the system yeah. It, it, it provided me with a clarity of what a role was. Of what yeah, the role. Yeah, yeah. So then I became a head, uh, deputy head teacher mm -hmm. uh, and was deputy head teacher for four years. And the school uh, had an Ofsted in the third week I was there and we got an RI. Uh, uh, so we'd gone for, it went from a good school. But actually, again, that gave, and again, a brilliant staff with a brilliant head teacher who they took the car right and they and they ran with it and said okay yeah. how are we going to be good and we got we got a good two years later and, mm -hmm. and but it was a brilliant staff and a brilliant group of people yeah. uh, and at the same time I did my training my MPQH and those kind of bits yeah. and then went on uh, started applying for head headships and I applied for four or five and got nowhere really and then I applied for a school in Whitby uh, and it's that moment when I walked in the school and it was it was felt like the right place. It was yeah. the scruffiest school I'd ever walked into, but there was something that actually real, real, really appealed to me. Yeah, actually really appealed about the job that was needed and the job that I could offer. Yeah, and something brilliant about the kids in that school. Yeah. Uh, and so I applied for that job and and I got it and I've been there ever since. So it's uh, so I became a head teacher just about six years ago. Uh, and the school at that point was two times RI, mm -hmm. uh, and was sat in RI, and we had HMI visits and all, yeah. all that stuff. So, yeah. so to kind of take a headship that's in that position is it, quite daunting. Yeah. Uh, we at, at that point, if we didn't, I didn't know where we were going to be at that point. The behaviour wasn't great in school. Yeah. Teaching wasn't great, but actually the teachers were great. Mm. So they were really good teachers, but but actually there was a number of systems that needed to be put in place so the teacher could teach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so things around behaviour needs to, to be sorted. And once we kind of started to get those, actually these teachers were able to teach. And yeah, once yeah. they were able to teach, actually they were really good teachers. And, and, yeah, yeah. and so what I'm really proud of is we went, you know, two years later we got we got a good mm -hmm. uh, offset. And I don't base everything on offset and don't do decisions on offset. But actually, it does take a lot of pressure from you as a school. Yeah, it does, the, yeah. the system puts a lot of pressure on. Uh, but we did it without losing members of staff. That's uh, amazing. And so, really so amazing. we did it with the same group of people. So I've got I've got staff still there who've been working at school 28, 29 years. And mm. you know, I, I'm I'm quite proud that that my teachers there have been there since for a while. You know, you talk about recruitment yeah. and retention. Well, uh, I have that problem of getting rid of people because they yeah, just want yeah. to stay, and yeah, that's yeah. that's that's a real positive. So we're we're good, and we had an offset in June and got good again, which 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 is great, uh, and just allows us to do the things that we think are important. Uh, we in in, that, in the meantime we joined an academy trust as well, uh, but did that on our own terms because we were a good school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so joined a, a trust called the Inquire Learning Trust, which have been absolutely brilliant, and yeah. uh, they support and they challenge. Yeah. But equally, they allow us to get the things right for our school, so mm -hmm. that so we don't. There's not a, a diktat that you have to do it this way or that way. Yeah, yeah. But they allow us to get it right for our school. But they challenge us on the work we do, mm -hmm. and that, and that's a really positive relationship. And 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 the other thing that allowed us to do as a school, because Whitby's quite small. I don't know if you've been to Whitby, yeah. But it's quite a small town and mm -hmm. not a lot of capacity for staff development or moving staff forward. Mm -hmm. The trust we joined has. 29 different schools wow. uh, so there's a hub in in around Middlesbrough and Stockton there's a group of schools in Grimsby and mm -hmm. Hull and there's a group of schools in Tameside Manchester mm -hmm. and it's allowed us to for my staff to see really good practice yeah. but it's also allowed my staff to start to believe in themselves 
and the work they do because other people have come to see some of their practice yeah, as well. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's, it's that confidence build, but also that ability to call on expertise in different yeah. places as well. So that's been really powerful for us because Whitby itself didn't offer that opportunity to develop. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously I talk to lots of people on the Teachers Podcast and um, mats do come up. Yeah. Um, and I think that's definitely one of the strengths of a mat. Oh, yeah, definitely. That you can, you can basically look at a group of schools, work out what's working well, and then you can just yeah. fire that out across all yeah. the schools. You take the best bits of yeah. everywhere. I, th- I, think I think it's the best bit, but I think it's what's really good is, is for ours is... It's done as a conversation, not as a you will. Yeah, yeah. So, so you might take something out, but you might look at it and, and adapt it to context. Yeah. And because I, I think because every you know, school's still my, different. My, even my, if it's school, in a my school's you know coastal, forty uh, percent free school meals. Quite, mm. uh, and that's a very different context to mm. possibly a school in Yarm or a school in yeah, Stockton. Course, yeah. I think. Yeah. And so, so what might work there won't necessarily work in my place. But there are themes and ideas that that actually can work yeah, so and, yeah. and and so the, our trust is great that it doesn't impose yeah but it does question and and that's and and that's it's, it's been really powerful for us over the last few years yeah fantastic i just want to go back to some things that you mentioned um so you mentioned that you did a degree in psychology yes do you think that's helped you understand children in your role especially as head teacher i i, I think it i think that the bit that was really, I was really, the bit I was really interested in was was kind of social psychology, and that the dynamics of groups mm-hmm. really, and, and around how groups work. So, so there's a bit around that management of children mm-hmm. and that management of of ethos. I think that that kind of comes from that on how you get children to believe the things and to be on on the same page as you mm-hmm. in kind of moving it forward. I'd, I'd, I'd like to say it, it's overly helped, but I can't remember much of it, really. So, <laughs> I just wondered, you know, I just thought so it was, it was really useful at the time. And there, I think there are probably things, and my wife's, my wife's doing a PhD in psychology. Mm-hmm. So, so she's, she's kind of left teaching now and she's doing a PhD. Yeah. So she's still really knowledgeable. So I'll still come and talk to her about, about those things. Yeah. But, so there, there are bits that probably channel my thinking, but I don't overly think that it's, you probably uh, just know it's probably, it. It's there and it's just sat rather than it's something that, that comes to the forefront of mind often. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, you talked about school improvement. Um, so if there, there are schools that need to improve, would you say that there's one thing that all schools need to do or is it completely based just I, on, on the individual school? I, I, I think there are, there's, there's a core set of kind of things that, that all schools need to do, really. I think if behaviour's not there... Mm-hmm. then actually you're on a hiding to nothing. You, you know, you, you, you can't, can't talk about teaching if, if behaviour... So, the, you know, the first thing I had to do at the, sc- uh, the school I became head of was get behaviour right. Mm-hmm. And once we started to get behaviour right, we could start to look at teaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I think there's that bit around systems and uh, around behaviour and how you manage behaviour. And I don't think it necessarily has to be the same. I don't think, you know, some schools exclude some schools do that i don't think it, i think it's a different model i think there, there are different stresses and pressures between primary and secondary mm-hmm. uh in terms of that uh but actually getting behavior right and getting your systems of behavior right and being consistent around behavior and as a head teacher taking the responsibility of behavior mm into your role yes, rather than from absolutely. teachers role so that teachers can do their job i think is really key uh, and that's not saying that you don't help teachers work on their practice and, mm. and do those things around behaviour management and those things. But actually, there's a bit at the end of the day, if a child's not letting the class work, yeah. actually, we've got to take that child out and, 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 and we've got to get that, that class working yeah. and getting those classroom cultures right. So, you know, and that my first two years at, at, at my current school were a massive challenge around yeah. behaviour and we had to work really hard on that and we couldn't do the other stuff. You couldn't, you couldn't focus on the other stuff until we got behaviour. So beha- I think behaviour is a key. I think the other bit is about trust. Mm. I, th- I, think, I think having been in a school that, where I was completely micromanaged and, yeah. and a head teacher that didn't trust anything that you, that you did and then being in a school where the head teacher trusts you mm. and would call you on it if you got it wrong but actually gave, gave you that chance gave you that rope to have a go and, and to try stuff and to do stuff. I know which kind of school I think is best for teachers' well-being and, and, and that's one where teachers feel trusted 
um, teachers are able to be reflective about their practice and talk openly about their practice mm. without it feeling like they're being judged or not, and, and then can be su- supported in the right way. So, you know, so the, if, you know, if, if you can have open conversations about teaching about what's working and what's not working, mm. then, you can su- then you can have those conversations that help teachers move forward in their practice. Yeah, and, everyone needs to be and, open And that comes it. from trust, you know, and I think yeah. trust is quite a hard thing to set up. In my current school, that was, that was really hard. Uh, the school, historically, the head teacher had only ever come from internally. Mm. So, so it had internal head teacher, deputy went to head, deputy went to head. So nothing new came nothing in. Nothing new came in. And I was the first person to come from outside. Mm. Uh, and there was a lot of scepticism mm-hmm. uh, about who does he think he is. And I had to earn my stripes there. Yeah, you know, yeah, I had to yeah. really kind of earn that trust. But we're in a position now where, where, the, where there's trust and, yeah. and we have really good conversations about learning and there's an openness about developing practice. And, and that's the kind of culture that I want to develop and yeah. it, it's not overly rigorous around monitoring we do monitor but we, we, it's not it's not draconian and it's not yeah, yeah. you know it's about staff being honest about themselves mm-hmm. rather than I'm coming to look at you and doing less than observation you know I'm, I'm, I don't have a collect planning in I don't because I don't need to yeah you know yeah. I know those teachers are doing a good job yeah. and, and they know the expectation and, yeah. and 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 but that takes time to develop doesn't it it does. It absolutely does. Thank you. Um, so you're on the podcast for a reason. Okay. Um, how how is your school different from other schools? I think one of the things that that we've done. So we've we've spent the last three to four years looking at uh, our curriculum. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, since 2015, really, we, we kind of 2015, we had our Ofsted, we we got a good, and that gave us a bit of time and freedom to do the things that we believed. Mm-hmm. rather than when we were in our... So the school was two times RI when I, when I came to it, and we were jumping through quite a lot of HMI, Ofsted, local authority hoops yeah. to, to, to get to where we need to be. And, and we had to do that. You know, there's a bit where, you know, you have to play that game to do it. Yeah. And did I agree with all the things we, we did? Probably not. Mm. But actually, in that situation, the first thing you want to do is you want to get your school out of out of RI because that gives you the the freedom to make the the right choices for your school. Mm. So, so when we got good, we started to look at curriculum, and that that came in at the same time as I got as uh, my deputy of thirty five years left. Mm -hmm. Uh, She retired at that point; she'd been at the school thirty five years, and so we got a new deputy into school, and we started to look at curriculum. And we've been looking at curriculum for the last kind of. Four, five, four years really. So that was that was twenty fifteen, December twenty fifteen. So it was almost four years. So that's helpful, so, really, yeah. when you look at Ofsted now. Well, it, well, <laughs> we, we we feel uh, there's a bit around, you know, I know they talk around in- curriculum intent and, and and implementation and impact. Yeah, yeah. But actually, we've been having those conversations around curriculum and what we want curriculum to be for the last four years. Now, we've never been a school that has stripped back curriculum because actually we. You know, it's, it's firmly our belief that uh, that curriculum is to be broad, mm-hmm. uh, and the reason for that is is you know you just have to look at the reading the SATS reading papers, yeah, yeah. and actually children who do well in those are children with, with broad knowledge base. Yeah, and so so we've we've talked really hard about about what is that knowledge base, what's knowledge, and and I think it's more than just knowledge of facts. Yeah, I think there's there's an experiential element to the, our curriculum, mm-hmm. which we feel is really important. So. In the school, uh, when I came, 30% of children hadn't been to the beach. And in Whitby. In Whitby. And, and, that, that, and that's quite incredulous, really. You know? and, and their world was, you know, we, our school is less than a mile from the beach. So it's, a, it's kind of a 15, 20 minute walk from the beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they hadn't been down to the beach. So uh, for us, we kind of said, actually, how are we going to get children to have those experiences? Because it, it, it's that ultimately, you know, in school, we believe reading is the core. Mm-hmm. Uh, of 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 our of our curriculum, but actually we need to we need to place experience there. Yeah. And the other bit we need to do was to, was to create a, a a quality around the work, and and those those were our kind of three points that we kind of I think, how does reading become that core? And we found that reading couldn't become the core, whilst there was a the language and vocabulary. So we've done significant work on speech and language, mm-hmm. and and that that's fits at core from our children from when they come in nursery, and. We've done significant work around uh, around experience. So we, we have something called pledges, which are a set, of experience, a set of experiences which children will have 
throughout their time at school. So if they're with them six years, so they will go down the beach, they will go into a forest, they will build sand castles, they will, uh, they will visit a city, they will perform on a stage, all those kind of things which are really important because there's, there's language around that. So an example, so if, you know, the word cow, you know, you can, children can read cow at the, uh, in their phonics, yeah. in, in reception really easily, and they can probably join it up to a picture of a cow. Mm-hmm. But actually, it doesn't mean they understand what a cow is. Yeah. Because I know if when you go and st- sit, stand next to a cow and you take time to see them, they're, they're in awe of the size and the yeah. smell and the scale and the heat and the, and the sounds and all yeah. those things, which is very, very different to a cow on a page or, or even watching it in a film sometimes. Yeah. So we, we, we think that's really... So, so at an early age, trying to get that broad range of experience, mm. we think is really important because actually reading understanding it stems from that broad range of experience and and uh so we work really hard on phonics because decoding is important Mm -hmm. but actually the other side around how do we develop understanding vocabulary and build vocabulary but then the other bit and the thing that probably has the most impact for us is around uh creating a curriculum that's about producing quality Mm -hmm. and so when we look at a curriculum whilst you know we use the national curriculum and, Mm -hmm. and schools you know that that's our core of these are the things that we will teach children mm-hmm. uh, and but actually one the key element of it is the idea of a quality end product mm. so by that knowledge of a quality end product whether it be a piece of art whether it's a, is therefore you're building fundamental teaching mm. of, so not just the knowledge but the procedural knowledge there's, there's, I, I, they're skills aren't they I mean we like right. to call it procedural knowledge but it is skills but actually the thing you know we had children who weren't to, taught to draw yeah. in school yeah. and actually you have to teach them you yeah, know you, you know it. at the end of the day we're, we're, we're a school and we teach so so if we want children to draw in a certain way mm. we've got to teach them how to do it if we want yeah. to, children to use paint we've got to teach them how to do it yeah. and and children produced a lot of art but they were never taught art yeah. in school and that that when we kind of really broke down our curriculum is we found that there were lots of things that children weren't taught mm-hmm. uh they kind of were just expected and i think in some ways it's because maybe us as teachers maybe we've had a different experience yeah um, but well, exactly. a, a, as children and and those skills yeah. you know a lot of the things we're talking about are things that well, my, my daughter's my, already done yeah. my dad was a plumber as a parent. so yeah. my dad was a plumber so so i remember as a boy uh we had a shed at the back of the garden that had like a workbench in and stuff like that. And I did lots of that, that kind of stuff with yeah. my dad. But lots of kids now aren't no, doing that, no. you know. And, and so actually we've got to teach them to use the tools or to use the materials or use yeah. the media or to sew or to do those things because that a lot of them aren't being taught those things at home. Yes. You know, I, I, you know, my nan used to teach me to knit, you know. Yeah. You know, all, all those kind of things, yeah. which, which in my experience, you just uh, kind of stuff that just happened. Mm-hmm. But actually... For a number of our children, they're not. So, yeah. if you want quality end product, you've got to teach them the skills to make a quality end product. So, and give them the experience. So, we as kind well. of looked at the work of Ron Berger. I don't know if you know Ron Berger. So, he, he wrote a book called Ethics of Excellence, which was about creating uh, that idea of quality product and mm-hmm. and how we how you get children to create quality, quality product and how you build curriculum that builds to the creation of quality products. So, so, for example, if you wanted children to do a piece of writing there's core elements that might go to that. So there's core knowledge that children have. Because, you know, I firmly believe that if children know the stuff they're writing about, mm-hmm. then actually the writing, then they, then you can start looking at the craft of writing. Yeah. Because you're taking the, the pressure off the, the knowledge so yeah. you can start focusing on, 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 on those Especially bits. if they've experienced it because, you know, when you're uh, saying... If you're writing about a character, if you've experienced it, it's so much easier to think of the word. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 that, and so the other element of that thing is there's lots of work around talk in mm. school. Talk is really, really important because I, th- I think, sorry, chest moved. <laughs> <laughs> but talk's re- a really important bedrock of, of children's understanding. Mm-hmm. So getting children to talk around language, talk around character, to talk around place, to talk around, you know, uh, if you want children to understand the story, Mm-hmm. So, for example, take the, the giant's, uh, giant's Necklace by Marco Morpurgo, which is mm-hmm. a great story set on a beach and a great ghost story. But if you've not been on a beach in a stormy day, How the story makes it? little sense. Yeah. Where actually, if you've been there and heard the crashing and those things, then actually suddenly you, you're talking at a different level around that story. Yeah. So, so the key bit for us is around that end product, but then thinking, okay, if we want to create that and we want to create those rich conversations, 
what are the things we need to put in place mm. to allow those rich conversations to have. So, so there's the experiential side and there's the product side mm-hmm. and then the curriculum kind of fits between those two yeah. really and that, that's kind of how it works. And it, it's led to massive improvement in the quality of what children do but also their belief in themselves and their pride in the work that they do and it, 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 it kind of becomes a bit of a snowball really around children you, you know you kind of walk into class and children are desperate to show me their work yeah they're desperate to show me what they're doing and that's a big change from three four years ago yeah and and yeah it's great you've so. done a fantastic job there of answering four of my questions all oh, right you. okay sorry <laughs> no brilliant <laughs> it's really helpful i'm like oh wow you just answered that one as well so clearly it is transforming the lives of the children as well yeah i i, I mean i i I think, I think it's, it's, it's that bit, it's about, you know, we have conversations with parents and, when, and parents come in and are looking at the quality of what children are doing now. And, uh, and I think they're shocked, really. And, you know, and the thing is, my school's one of those schools where over half of the parents went to the school. Yeah. And over half of their parents went to the school. So, yeah. so I've got parents who were taught by some of my teachers, because some of my teachers are still there. You know, yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. things I'm really proud of is we haven't lost lots yeah. of teachers in, in that transformation of school. You know, we've, mm-hmm. we've still got the same teachers. Yeah. Uh, but they, so they know the teachers, but equally their, their parents were taught by some of the teachers as well. So yeah, I've got yeah, teachers yeah. who've been there th- over 30 years. Yeah, yeah. But they're damn good teachers. Really, sorry, swearing. Uh, really good teachers. And they really, they know the community. Yeah, I think and, that's and, important. And, and that's so important, you know. So, mm-hmm. My school's on the east side of Whitby, and I don't, I don't know how much you know of Whitby, but Whitby, uh, we're on the wrong side of town, officially. Right, so, so in Whitby, there's a, there's a swing bridge at the front, right. and then there's a, a, another bridge at the top, and they're the only two ways between the two sides, so the River Esk kind of runs down the middle. Uh, and east, east Whitby is the wrong side of town, so it's very much the, the fishing communities and things mm. like that, where the other side is more the tourist community. Right. Uh, and traditionally, the school's been the wor- been considered to be the worst school in Whitby. Yeah. That's yeah. that's that's a historical, but it's not. No. It, you know, and our, but what's brilliant about our families is they're staunchly defensive of their school. Yeah. And staunchly passionate about about the school. And the school's seventy years old next year, so it's wow. uh, yeah. So it's uh, you know it's something. I, I, so you're I'm, I, the party I'm as well. really proud to be custodian of it, and I, I do feel that I'm. It's not my school. Yeah. It's their school. And my job while I'm there is to make that school better. Yeah. And when I leave, that it's in a in a place good hands in good hands well. to, to move on. So that's yeah. that's how I see see my job really. It's not mine, it's it's the community school. Yeah. Even though we're an academy, we still belong the community is still yeah. a key part of the work we do. And I think that's I think that's a lovely way to look at it. And um, so you've talked a lot about your product based curriculum. Yes. Um so, and you started looking at curriculum about four years ago, which was probably, you know, quite, well, a fluke, but also really a well, helpful one. It, it was because what we'd been forced to do before that was kind of narrow uh, curriculum around, yeah. you know, you get, you get forced to kind of, narrow, and we, we'd started to look at it and, and you're kind of forced to narrow it because, you know, you have to improve your English results, you have to improve your, improve your maths results, mm-hmm. and you get funneled down into that, into that, into that narrowing of curriculum and uh but what we found and i I think there was a a revelatory moment uh in the 2016 sats which i think uh, lots of people had a revelatory (laughs) moment in the 2016 oh yes where actually that narrow curriculum came back to bite you Mm -hmm. because actually if children didn't have a broader vocabulary and broader knowledge yeah actually against that how reading particularly the reading sat yeah uh, actually they really couldn't access that paper yeah because it was much more about knowledge mm-hmm. and language and vocabulary than it was potentially about reading yes. and, uh, uh, and therefore those with broader curriculum and, and broader experiences did better now we did quite well in 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 that in that paper but i think that was maybe cohort lucky yeah. uh, to a yeah, degree yeah, and yeah. I, uh, but actually what what made us step back and think is if that's where it's going and what do we need what to do? What do we need to do? And, and how do we broaden that curriculum? So it starts in our reception, starts with our nursery and reception children and builds through mm-hmm. and we'll start, to, we'll start to see the impact. And, we're, and we're, we are starting to see the impact as it kind of grows through, really. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I think people will be really interested in, so obviously we're talking uh, quite deeply about curriculum, yep. uh, new Ofsted framework, all about curriculum. 
how have you prepped for deep dives? Well, we, we haven't overly prepped for deep dive because we've had, we had an Ofsted in June. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite weird, isn't it? Because we had an Ofsted June 2019, so mm -hmm. just about... Just before, just, yeah. Just before. However, there were elements of that new framework okay. so that we essentially did have a deep dive into early reading mm -hmm. as part of our inspection. And the whole afternoon was looking at curriculum right, uh, yeah. with a curriculum leader. So there were... We, there are elements of, the, of yeah. that new framework, but one of the things that has it's made us really look at and, and kind of consider and change because it's primary school picture around. I, I do think the framework's been written around secondaries, okay, and right. and the subject leader kind of bit around the deep dive seems to fit much more to a secondary model yes. than it does a primary model. So if you're a one form entry primary, you, you might be expecting people. I've got. NQTs or RQTs who might be asked to lead a subject yeah. and might be going into, into a meeting with Ofsted. Now, I, as a head, I kind of think, actually, I wouldn't do that. So what it's made us look at is, is and I think that's really challenging. Yeah. I, and I think that it's challenging for a range of reasons. It's, it's the smaller the school, it's challenging around time. It's yeah, challenging absolutely. around uh, capacity, you know, uh, uh, and, and also uh, to be budget -wise, responsible really for what difficult. everyone else is teaching. Yeah. And to understand that. So, so we've, we've looked at how ours works and, and that leadership model. And um, whilst we did that, we stripped it back to we've created a curriculum team of three. Right. And the others just get on with their jobs. Right. And that curriculum team of three, we free them up to go and monitor. And we've got a rolling cycle around those three leading on curriculum. And so I've got... I've got my year five teacher who's just, the, so she did a history degree, mm. really knowledgeable around history, re, and, and looking at that, I've got a, a brilliant science teacher in year two mm -hmm. who's leading on science aspect, and then my deputy head is, yeah. is overseeing all. And they, they meet termly, they, do, uh, they meet twice termly, so they have a whole day twice mm -hmm. termly to go, and, and I go and teach in a class on that day and free one of them up, because yeah. uh, we've got no money. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No school has any money. But uh, but great that you're also experiencing the children again, well, because I, a lot of head teachers la, don't do that. Last year I taught uh, 74 days, last year, yeah. uh, uh, for, for a range of reasons, but partly because I do still, I'm, I'm still a teacher. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I do love getting in the classroom, I'm passionate around that. But so rather than have this model of, their subject lead for this, we've got a curriculum team that, that leads on the foundation. So we've got an English lead, a yeah. math lead, and then a curriculum team. And then the others just get on with their jobs yeah, and get on with teaching. Obviously, this uh, podcast is around CPD for teachers, you know, no pressure. Yep. CPD where they can listen, they can take an idea and they can implement it at low cost, um, low time. Yep. What kind of things do you want to bring um, for teachers to kind of try out in their classrooms? Uh, well, one thing I'm, I'm massively passionate about is I think all teachers should read to their class every day. Mm -hmm. or, and, and, and there's a couple of things around that. I think it's, firstly, it's, it's just brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, if I think back to my time at school, they're memories and we're creating, you know, particularly in primary, we create, we create a, a shared culture and a shared experience. Yeah. Uh, plus, it doesn't take a lot of planning. No, <laughs> you know, it doesn't you know. know. And, and it's, it's quite easy to do. Uh, you know, the, the, for some people... And enjoyable. And it's really enjoyable. And, 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 but actually, that's the point where we can challenge children as well. You know, there's mm -hmm. that choice of text, that choice of material, that choice of the reading that we choose will help us drive on the work that we want to do. And I, and, but I do think you need to be able to get kids into that comfort of... of being in the middle of a story so that we're yeah. not breaking it up with say, and now let's look at the front of the verbial or let's look at this. Yeah. Actually, we need to just go with that flow of the story yeah. and, and things like that. And, and I think sometimes we lose that. But it is also a great way to widen the knowledge as well. You know, oh, when yeah, you think completely. about that reading test, yeah. you know, there's books about everything. Yeah, exactly. And, and, ha and that choice is really important, that, ch that choice around books. So that would, that would be one aspect that I think is really important. I think the other bit and the other bit we've done in school is, is it's, we strip marking kind of doesn't really happen in our books, really, mm -hmm. a, a min, a minimal at best. But actually that in-class feedback is, yeah, yeah. is really key. And the bit that really, really worked for us around intervention, because we, we, we've used a range of inter intervention models, but actually the best way of doing intervention support is we, we've developed a, a, a pre and post teach mm -hmm. kind of model for intervention, yeah. which is supporting those children 
to, so that uh, so we we pre-teach some of the stuff so yeah. that when it comes into the lesson, they actually they're able to keep up with with the lesson and yeah. post-teach so that by the, at the end of the session, that if they haven't quite got it, we're teaching so they're ready for the next day. Yeah. And yeah. that that's had a significant impact yeah. around children being able to work within the lesson and actually by setting up your staffing to do that and that that probably is an SLT kind of thing, but by doing that that makes the teaching in the lesson much easier. So, so they're not differentiating to three levels and they're not doing, doing all those kind of things, but actually we're working at the same objective and then the right amount of scaffolding and support in, in lesson. The ready, to do that. Yeah, yeah, the ready. Okay, if you could wave a magic wand, then how would you solve the life-work balance problem? I, it's really hard, isn't it? I, 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 I think it, it goes from school to school. I mean, there are massive work-life balance problems in, in my school. Uh, and that's partly around building. Uh, we're, my b school building is massive, absolutely huge. We're a one form entry primary school, but it used to be about 10, 15 years ago, a full two form entry. Mm -hmm. uh, and through building changes and housing changes and stuff like that, uh, which means we've got a massive building, but with half the staff that used to be in it. Mm -hmm. And to keep that space looking good, you've got to, uh, you've got to think about your models of how you do displays and boards or take a lot of the boards down which is what we've done yeah, yeah. Uh, so so that kind of st steady rolling program uh, and, and just thinking around what's important so things uh working walls are really really impacted on, on workload for us really reduce workload around displays in classroom and, and, and yeah. those those kind of bits uh but the key bit is you know i i is, is i think it comes from slt and i mm -hmm. think slt have to you know, you can't stop people working, can you? You, no. you know, but actually, there are things you can put in place. So we don't send emails at weekends. We don't send emails after after four thirty, uh, and uh, and and that that doesn't happen. So we we switch that off. Mm -hmm. uh, now, some staff might like to write emails or to do that. That's their choice. But but actually, from me and from SLT, we we don't send that out, and we don't put that pressure on people to look at them at the weekends because yeah. often they. they I've seen them dropped. As, my wife had, used to have them dropped on her as a bomb. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, on a Sunday afternoon, email would drop, and it was like boom, and, and, and expect it to, yeah, to be so, done for tomorrow, and so, it's just not yeah. realistic. And, and I think I think there's there's got to be the, those realistic times. So you know, if if you've just got to to look at staff, you know, I think we've got to treat staff as human, mm. and you know, they've got children, they've got families, they've got all those kind of things, and at various points. You need to give them the time. You know, if their kids in the show, they get one chance to see it. I know. And have I it, agree. Ha I agree. Having been, uh, my son got taken. Uh, so I've got two children, uh, and I remember my second one uh, got rushed into hospital. Mm. And so I went down and I phoned the head teacher. Said I'm not going to be in tomorrow. He's in hospital. He's on a breath. He's on breathing apparatus and stuff like that. And she said, "Well, his his, his mom's with him. Why can't you come into school?" And, and, and that, that kind of struck that struck that struck a chord with me that actually where's the humanity? And I think we've just got to be human. I think and, as, and as leadership teams, there are various points. You yeah. know, at the end of the day, I want my staff to do the best job they can every day. But sometimes that you know the whole idea school of school can that, run without them. The whole idea of outstanding. Well, I, I'm fully aware that school can run without me. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. and that actually, if I left, school would move on. Yeah. It doesn't. You know. So. And, and we see ourselves as invaluable and, and that part of sometimes part of our identity, isn't it? Yeah. And I think we but actually we've got to get we've got to have a school that values them and their families and their lives as well as yeah. the job. Because at the end of the day it's a job. It's probably the most important job in the world. Yeah. But it's a job. And you only get one chance to see your kid in the nativity. You only get one chance to see your children's sports days. Yeah. You you know, those things yeah. don't happen. And, and why should uh, you miss out just yeah, because you're a teacher? Exactly. So, so for, for us, let people do that. And, and we do things like so. If they go, if a staff goes on a residential, we give them days in lieu. To, wow, to, that's so to, unusual. We give them days back in lieu. That's uh, why you've got teacher retention. Yeah, but but it's, it's really important to look yeah. at, look at those aspects, you and, know, and, and be aware and and to read it, you know. It, it, so you know, just before half term, you could, I could tell staff were really tired. Yeah. So we could have said we're not doing staff meeting this week. You're yeah. just going to go home. You just, you know, yeah. you know, we're not going to do that. And just reading and 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 reading your staff under, you know, and this is something I couldn't do 15 years ago. I, I couldn't have been ahead 15 years ago. I couldn't, you know, you see, I see some young people go on to be heads and they're brilliant, but I couldn't have done that. Yeah. I wasn't emotionally ready. I'm not, 
it's that weird thing my, my wife will say that I'm the least emotionally intelligent person she's ever met right. uh, but I do think emotional intelligence is really important mm. and and it's something that I've developed over time so yeah. so now I'm very close to 50 it, I, I kind of get people <laughs> whereas <laughs> when I was kind of late 30s I probably didn't mm. uh, but I understand it more now yeah. and I understand that idea of them as people yeah. and and so therefore to respond and at various points you want them to be the best they can be but mm-hmm. there are caveats to that some days that best is only is only average yeah because there could be a whole host of stuff going on in people's lives and families and stuff like that and we as schools we've got to be open to that we've got to listen to that and at various points we've got to support that mm-hmm. that's the key to well-being in schools is that you've got emotionally intelligent leaders that are supporting their staff at the right points because we're not all we can't all be 100 percent on it all the time for a whole host of reasons and if we do those things that's how we keep our staff in school that's how we we keep our staff together and working and and as part of your team anything if you don't value them then they won't value you no that's i completely agree you're absolutely right okay so who's your favorite teacher at school and why my favorite teacher and it's that weird thing It, it kind of comes back now to the actually there's two uh huge both have had a huge influence on me and what i believe now mm-hmm. uh my first is mr williams yeah. mr williams was the year four teacher so uh uh so when i was about nine mm-hmm. uh and was just the best storyteller just the most amazing storyteller and i don't can't remember doing any work in his class but I can remember stories. And he read us Animal Farm, and I remember crying when Boxer died, and, and, and all, the, all those kind of things. But I have distinct memories of his storytelling, and yeah. stories about him, and just loved him as a man. Mm. He was just brilliant. And then the other one was the person who inspired me to like Shakespeare. And that, that was, uh, I, I, I passed my 11 plus and went to a school called the King's School in Worcester. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I went there on a scholarship. and kind of hated Shakespeare and hated that and and then there was a a new teacher came and kind of went into his classroom which was in in the crypt of Worcester Cathedral which was quite cool yeah and he was he was there with sticky up hair Mm -hmm. and like a cardigan and a black shirt and a black tie and he was smoking a cigarette in the corner of the classroom which kind of you could do at that Mm -hmm. point that many years ago and he was just the coolest teacher his name was Johnny Meth which is just the best teacher name. And uh, <laughs> it's just, it, 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 he was just, he, he must have been about 21, 22. So he was like really young and he, he only yeah. taught for a year. All oh, right. He, he only taught for a year. And then he went on to do, uh, to run a theatre in Norwich and, and then he works in theatre in London and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But, uh, but he, I remember he, he put some music on and none of us got, we, we were the remedial class. We were the group of kids who, right. were, who were rubbish. And we walked in and he put on uh, some dub uh, put Linton Crazy Johnson, which for a, uh, a white middle class boy or white working stroke middle class boy who'd only listened to uh, the Moody Blues and uh, Simon and Garfunkel because that's what his dad played mm-hmm. and maybe a bit of Bowie if I was lucky. It was like I'd never heard music like that. That was kind yeah, of music. Yeah. And, but it, what really worked is it got me to understand the idea of the outsider. Uh, yeah. So, so we were doing the Merchant of Venice, and it got me to understand the role of Shylock mm-hmm. and how he felt an outsider from society, which is why, which led to his actions. And so he linked dub poetry of Linton Quasi Johnson into into Shakespeare, and got me to understand the the importance of character and mm-hmm. how character was written and how character was portrayed. And and I love him for that because that kind of led me to kind of have a passion around English and literacy. Plus, he was the coolest person. He looked a bit like Robert Smith and, and stuff like that, uh, of The Cure. And, and, and yeah, so, uh, yeah, those two. And are such, two. such vivid memories. It kind of just demonstrates to us, doesn't it, how, how well, much we impact children. I think relationships are key. I, th- I think, I think there's, we kind of forget, don't we? And I, th- I think one of the huge powers around primary education is is the importance of that relationship between teacher and class and i think it does happen in secondary but i think it's harder i mm-hmm. think it's harder for secondary teachers to build those relationships with the amount of time they have with pupils mm-hmm. but actually they ca- it can still stick and those bits can define yeah. and, are, and are really important so. yeah thank you right last question what did you want to be when you grew up not a teacher uh so no <laughs> never never saw teaching as a thing that uh, about 10, probably a vet, I think. About 15, uh, 
an actor performer about 18 when I was doing my degree I kind of uh, wanted to be in a band and played in bands and stuff like that and played mandolin and bass guitar and things like that uh, and wanting to be that a rock star a rock star <laughs> but never 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 a teacher really and then kind of fell into teaching and fell in love with it and then and still passionate about it I think it, it is an important job it is the you know it has days which are just the most immense highs yeah in terms of when when things fly and, yeah. and, and that feeling you get from seeing children learn it, it, it is brilliant and it is a brilliant job and yeah I, I'd recommend it to anybody but I, I wasn't what I wanted <laughs> yeah. and I think that passion definitely shines through right, thank you well, thank yeah. you so much for being on the podcast. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. <laughs>